Well, the Arctic Species Trend Index is the latest uh, headline indicator from the Circumpolar Biodiversity Monitoring Program, the CBMP. The CBMP is the Arctic Council CAF Working Group uh, Cornerstone Program that's focused on improving our ability to detect important biodiversity trends around the Arctic, understand what's driving those trends, and get that information out more quickly to decision and policy makers. And the Arctic Species Trend Index, or the ASTI as we call it, is a key indicator that can really actually pull together data that's been collected in the last 60 years from all regions of the Arctic and actually make some sense of it and get it into the hands of the decision makers so we can make uh, better choices on where we deploy our monitoring efforts and also uh, where we should actually be worried in what areas. What kind of data is it and uh, who's been collecting it? Well, what we do is we, we collect peer-reviewed data on population trends for what we call Arctic vertebrate species, so fish, birds, and mammals. Uh, we have 890 populations involving 323 species in the ASTI, and that actually represents 37% of all known Arctic vertebrate species. So it's actually a very good data set, and it's actually the Arctic component of a global index called the Living Planet Index, and the Arctic part portion of that index is actually the most representative data set we have. And uh, who's been collecting the data? Have it been both scientists and uh, other people just in, in the field? Ab absolutely. We, the data we were, we were really pleased in, in about six weeks we were able to collect 890 data sets from all our partners and this really speaks to the networks that the CBMP has been able to build in all eight Arctic nations. And actually the Russian Federation was the biggest contributor of data. The data sets come from all sorts of different sources. They come from national monitoring programs, uh, they come from regional monitoring programs. Uh, some species, such as moose, uh, are uh, counted every so often in places like Canada and Russia to help set hunting quotas. Uh, we have fish stocks that have been monitored over time. But we also actually have a lot of data now coming from what we call community-based monitoring programs. And there's a lot of great uh, community monitoring programs around the Arctic where local people are actually collecting information on things like beluga abundance and so forth. So the data comes from all over the place from diff for different purposes but we actually can use that data to actually ask ourselves what's happening at the Pan-Arctic scale and what are some of the trends we're seeing. And you just uh, released a new report. Tell me about the key findings. Well, uh, the, the, we originally released the Arctic Species Trend Index in 2010. Uh, and the idea is to use this index as a key indicator to track the Arctic's ecosystem response to change over time. So two years later, we decided to actually do some more in-depth analysis of our marine data sets, which is the strongest part of the whole ASTI, as well as uh, experiment or test with some new what we call spatial analysis techniques. And we're actually piloting these for the global index. And again, it's because we have the best data sets out of the whole Living Planet Index, we can start to do this. Um, so there's a whole host of interesting findings, um, ranging from uh, using the spatial techniques to actually determine what our monitoring coverage has been like currently as well as historically, and looking at where the gaps are. And we, we see that we have very strong data sets in places like the Bering Sea, in Iceland, and actually in northern Scandinavia, and uh, fewer data sets with less uh, data points in places such as northern Canada, northern Russia, and northern Greenland. Maybe not surprising considering how remote and extreme those environments are with less people. However, we've also been able to actually identify areas where we're seeing declines or clusters of declining vertebrates in certain parts of the Arctic. Um, an example is in northeast Siberia. We're seeing uh, declines over the last 60 years across the board. And also in places like the Canadian, certain parts of the Canadian High Arctic and the Labrador Sea. So that actually is very useful because it can actually identify to the decision makers and the policy makers where we might want to uh, deploy our limited resources for conservation efforts. Um, on, on the marine analysis, some of the interesting uh, findings was actually regarding pelagic fish. So these are fish that live in the water column. And when we took all the data sets we had and pulled them together and ran a trend, we realized that Arctic pelagic fish were more or less cycling on a 10-year cycle. And when we actually looked at something called the Arctic Oscillation, which is a large-scale climate oscillation that also operates on a 10-year cycle, there's a very tight relationship between the two. And, uh, and that's not just something interesting for the scientists, that's actually a great tool for managers and decision makers, because if we understand that there's a relationship between this climate oscillation and this pelagic fish species, we can actually make better decisions on how to manage those stocks, because we can start to predict 
how those stocks might be doing in time depending on what's happening with the Arctic Oscillation. So I would just highlight that as a really exciting finding and again shows the power of actually pulling together data from across broad geographic areas and starting to look at the patterns that come out.